All right, Meredith, thank you so much for being here. I'm so excited. Thank you. Uh, so I have so many questions because I feel like I, on, on the one hand, I feel like I know you because I fo- I've been following you on Instagram and just love your reels and your content. There's so much and you just look like you're having such a good time. And I really, you know, I, um, I get so much valuable information from your, from your stuff on your Instagram account, but I also feel like I, I still have so many questions about like who you are. <laughs> so, yeah. um, uh, so I guess first, you know, how old were you when you were diagnosed with ADHD and kind of what was going on in your life that really led you to start looking into it, um, and, and connecting the dots around, around this diagnosis? Officially, I was diagnosed at um, 40, but I was fairly certain years before that. Uh, the catalyst for me was um, going through the process with my daughter. And throughout that process, it was very clear to me right away that, you know, she was not the only one that had neurodivergence in the family. But for me, um, to be honest, I was so burnt out after all of the hoops and executive functioning demands of getting her diagnosed that I just kind of like avoided my personal diagnosis for a few years, but moved forward with the understanding that I most likely had ADHD. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So where, um, how old was she when she was diagnosed? She was in fourth grade. So she would have been, what's that like? 10, 9, 10 yeah. kind of was the age that she was at. I knew something was up. Uh, she was, you know, kind of that child that had a series of misdiagnoses or diagnoses before she had her ADHD diagnosis. Um, so we kind of knew much as a family much sooner, but uh, officially it was in fourth grade. Mm, yeah, I know. I feel like, uh, you know, so many of the women I interview came to their own diagnosis after their kids and really kind of being getting into that like mama bear mode where you're like, I'm going to do all the research and all the hyper focus right. on how to help my kid. And they'd be like, oh, yeah, research and hyper focus is part of it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Like that is exactly what happened. I I've always been like an information deep diver. So, of course, that's where my brain went. Um, and especially, I- I'm sure other parents with children with ADHD understand that feeling of they, they receive that diagnosis. But um, there's not a lot that happens after that in terms of education. So I felt that was on me to really explore this and understand what it meant for her and then me as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I feel like there is a lot of that feeling. Something that so many of us have in common is that feeling of like, how everybody else got the manual but me, right? And and that idea right. of like the I got I got to keep researching. Like some somehow it doesn't matter how much research you do, it still feels like you're missing something, right? You're missing right. the information, and I think that's kind of leads us to do a lot of that like deep diving. Mm-hmm. Like I have to read all the things in order to feel yeah. absolutely prepared, and yet at the same time always feeling like we've missed out on something, you know, like that there's something that everybody else knows. There's always more. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. And so when it comes to just like learning about my own ADHD in the beginning, it was that say it was the same thing where I'm like, this should be part of the diagnosis, right? <laughs> Which mm-hmm. is absolutely <laughs> the, like obsessive looking into it and then also feeling yeah. like, what what am I missing? What's the one book I'm supposed mm-hmm. to read, right? Like, oh, yep. like what are the crib notes? Does somebody tell me exactly what I'm supposed to know. I'm like, you've already read 12 yeah. books. You probably know what you're going to know. Right. <laughs> Um, interesting. So what was it when you were kind of, do you remember when you were, um, uh, you good? Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Um, do you, re- uh, do you remember when you were kind of looking into it for yourself? What were some of the things that really like hit home? You know, I feel like sometimes we get that really visceral reaction to identifying with ADHD and just being like, oh, oh, 
oh yeah, you know, and it's not fidget for me, at least it was like not talking about fidget spinners or, you know, can't sit still. It was talking about like Mm -hmm. the shame I had around the state of my house. Right. Or, or feeling like, you know, I'm a bad friend and, you know, it's so much, so much of that, like emotional stuff. Yeah, absolutely. I feel like that was the stuff that hit me as well. Um, There were so many light bulb moments and I can look at every phase of my life and notice things that just make so much more sense now. Um, Definitely when you said the same around the home, that was a big one for me. I was a hundred percent that really, really messy kid that Um, it wasn't that I didn't want a clean space. I just never knew how to get there. My mom would come in like once a month with a trash bag and just like clear stuff out. And I never felt like I could get on top of it. And then as an adult, um, you know, I had some college roommates that were wonderful people, but were really frustrated with my level of disorganization and living with me. And so I definitely, you know, learned to mask that symptom quite well. Uh, to the outside world. Like I definitely had that house that appeared to be picked up. But if you showed up unannounced, I would panic because there was probably stuff in really random spots. If you would just help yourself in my kitchen to go find the glass and started opening cabinets, I would be horrified because it was just everything shoved in, out of sight, out of mind. And it always felt like so intrusive when people saw what was really going on behind the scenes. So that was definitely a big one. Um, <clears throat> recognizing that shame and understanding that it's not because I'm lazy and I don't care. Like there was a real reason for this was huge for me. Right? Yeah, absolutely. And realizing, you know, I've said this before on the podcast too, like ex- what even is executive function? I had never right. heard that term until after my diagnosis when I was when I was sort of in- inducted into the world of ADHD and terminology. I had no idea, you know, that there could be this disconnect between, like you said, the desire to do things and the ability. And like that was never something that I ever talked about in therapy. Like it was always just about like, oh, I'm such a terrible person because I can't do blah, blah, blah. And, you know, that there wasn't this, um, you know, that there was something even called executive dysfunction, I think was so novel to me. I never heard that term either. And I don't think I heard it even as my daughter was going through her process until I like started reading more and hearing it in books and things like that. I never heard it from a clinician. So you know, having some words to put to what was going on was really helpful for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Now, um, was your husband or was your partner's reaction like, yeah, of course you have it or (laughs) were they surprised or? (laughs) Well, I'm a huge verbal processor. So it was, um, you know, since I did take such a big break between navigating my daughter's diagnosis and my own, um, I had talked about it with him a lot. Uh, we have a really close relationship. He's a, definitely a confident of mine, but, um, you know, he is very opposite of me. Like he is like kind of the king of executive function. So I don't think it was a huge surprise. And he has always said he saw a lot of me and my daughter and vice versa. So he was very supportive and was just like, yeah, obviously this is, this makes a ton of sense. Yeah. My husband is so sick of me talking about it. Um, but I remember when we were, cause I was diagnosed first and then both of my kids got diagnosed over the summer. And it was after we had had this whole conversation with the psychologist where the psychologist was talking a lot about, um, the stuff that I had been talking to him about, you know, casually for the last like two years where he finally had to admit, he's like, wow, you know, a lot about this. <laughs> it's like, I know. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Because he's been hearing me talk about it casually for so long at this point now that I'm like, you're probably mm-hmm. an expert too. Uh, Absolutely. <laughs> um, and so what are some of the things when you look back over, you know, in your childhood or looking back in your life that you, where you're like, oh my goodness, the signs were there all along. Um, oh my gosh. I can tell you stories for <laughs> Katie, probably days, but um, 
you know, I, I mentioned the being really messy kid, but um, one thing that really sticks out to me for my uh, like kind of childhood school experience is I did pretty well in school because I really was curious and loved learning. So I did great um, when it was a subject that I was interested in. And I liked science. I liked social studies. I liked writing. I liked English. I loved to read. So all those things were super easy for me. I never had to study. It was fine. But then math was like a different story for me. And I always kind of got by and did like the bare minimum, but I had no idea how to study. I had no idea how to organize myself at all. Like my scrapper keeper, you know, back in the the 90s was like such a hot mess. My backpack was a disaster. So even though I, you know, felt mostly successful in school, there was definitely this part of me that was like, why can I do all of these things? But why is this one particular thing so massively hard? And that followed me into um, college as well. I, uh, one kind of like very obvious story is when I um, dropping college algebra, I only had to take that one, you know, course to graduate from college with the degree I was pursuing. And I would get into college algebra. I would um, sometimes miss class during the first couple of weeks. And I would always go right up into that deadline to drop the class without penalty. And then I would drop it and be like, okay, I'm going to try again. It's going to be different the next semester. And I did that through the entire four years, just kind of avoiding and making it so much worse for myself because the farther you get from high school and not doing any math, the harder it is, right? And so I finally actually walked with graduation because they let you walk if you just had a couple credits outstanding, signed up and did it in six weeks at summer school. But I finally realized like I had this huge pressure to get it done. Like I had worn the cap and gown and I was applying for jobs with them understanding that I had a degree. So I finally like got through summer school. I went to tutoring every day and I got a C and I was so proud of myself getting that done but then it doesn't end there Katie so I got it done I moved to a new state to like start my new life um I had said that I had a degree on my resume for my first job and then when I transitioned to my first job also you know listed my degree and then went to the interview and then they called me and they're like Meredith we are checking your references and verifying your degree and your school says that you don't have a degree. Um, and I was like, oh, my goodness. I never submitted the transcript from that class to make it official. Ah. So here I was, just living my life, teaching out to graduate from college. But I actually hadn't. So I had to, like, pay all these fees and get a rest transcript sent to get the degree processed all because... I couldn't deal with those executive function pieces around that and with those subjects. Um, and of course, I tell this story and I laugh now, but there was like so much shame attached to it at this time. Like, I remember being so embarrassed to tell my parents that I hadn't done that task where it had just kind of completely slipped my mind. But now that I understand kind of what was happening in my brain, it makes total sense that that was the ADHD showing there. Right. Yeah. I, I know so much of it. I think so much of our negative self-concept as we grow into adulthood uh, as undiagnosed ADHD years is that feeling of like, what is wrong with me? <laughs> you know, and it just constantly over and over of like, I, sh yeah. why I don't understand why I, this slipped through the cracks. Right. Or like I am able mm -hmm. to do so many things, but I wasn't able to do this one thing. So what is wrong with yeah. me? And yeah. just, you know, having that question over and over and over again throughout your life and never having a real answer to it. Absolutely. Yeah. That was really a, a big like question answered for sure when yeah. I got that diagnosis. That's crazy. Uh, I had no idea businesses actually checked on your degrees that... <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know, that's so good. It was a, it's a very large, well-known uh, nonprofit. So I think they cross all their T's and dot their I's. And, you know, in this age, maybe they aren't 
they don't care as much. But I think at the time, since they had said a degree is required for this job, that they wanted to ensure that. That's good to know, because I always like, you know, whenever I moved, I always had my bachelor's diploma and I would always like it was one of those things that I had felt like I had to hold on to. But it was just like in an envelope in my attic. And I'm like, why do I have to yeah. always have you? And I was like, you know, it's not like I'm ever going to frame my bachelor's in political science and put it on my wall somewhere. Like, <laughs> it's just like I just yeah. so desperately wanted to throw it away. And I'm like, you can't really throw away your college diploma. But I'm like, who cares? Like, who would ever know or even look it up so it's good to know uh, businesses there are yeah, businesses who look it up so i got my degree i did do grad school so i'm sure at some point i would have realized i didn't actually like do that last step but had that not happened it, it might have been a bigger problem later on yeah, I did the cardinal sin. Well, I did such a stupid thing, which is now looking back at it is so clearly ADHD, which is I was doing my final semester of university and I already had enough credits to graduate. I, you know, this was just like mostly just credits to like finish out the year. And I got my dream job at a newspaper and I just decided to stop going to all these classes because I was like, you know, I've got enough to graduate. It was after the period where you could drop them. And I was like, I'm never going to grad school. It doesn't matter who cares. And so I just like flunked all the last cl the classes in the last semester, mm -hmm. which destroyed my GPA. And, but I was like, yeah. who cares? I have enough credit. I, you know, I did, I was able to get my diploma and, and it didn't really seem like a big deal until now, um, you know, 25 years later, almost, I wanted to go to grad school and I beg, you know, pleading with my university, my alma mater to take them off my transcript and they won't because they, yeah. they said, I was like, can I get a withdrawal? And they were like, no, um, it's been too long. And there's no evidence that you didn't attend the classes and flunked. Right. And I was like, uh, okay, that's a weird reason, but I guess. So now I've got these like F's on my script and I'm just like, what was I thinking? It was so, it's so frustrating and so short sighted. And I'm like, there's ADHD yeah. written all over that. A hundred percent. It's not now or not now. Right. Like we're thinking about what's affecting us in that moment. And in that moment, our brain wants to do something else. So it makes total sense to me if that would happen. Yeah. It's so frustrating. Yeah. So, yeah, so you have your MBA. Um, I'm curious, what were you, you know, before you pivoted to ADHD coaching, What what's your background? Because you have a psych background too, right? Yeah. So I was really, um, I got my MBA when I was pregnant with my first child and really getting interested in uh, both. Um, you know, because it's never one thing with ADHD, right? We're interested in so many. I was really interested in someday becoming an entrepreneur. And I also um, really was drawn to organizational psychology. So kind of wanted to understand how businesses were ran for my own personal reasons and wanting to apply psychology in that way. Um, as far as my professional background, um, I am definitely that uh jane of all trades personality <laughs> i have tried a lot of things um definitely like common threads were uh employee training and development things like that um you know i joke with each of my kids i had to start a new business so i would like you know quit whatever job i was at when i when i'm maternity leave Start a business, do that for a couple years, have some success, but um, that typical ADHD thing of like getting stuck and not being able to like navigate the path through and get the right support kind of always sabotaged me a little bit. Um, and I would also, you know, I wasn't aware of how, you know, important it is to avoid burnout as a business owner with ADHD. So, you know, I really enjoyed it, but always kind of got stuck, would go back to corporate. And, um, you know, I kind of, got into ADHD coaching after starting to work with coaches myself, like during that process, when even before I was diagnosed, I was working with coaches to um, understand my ADHD better, be able to help myself, be able to help my daughter, because that was the piece where I was like, there's got to be more than just a prescription. Like, I know I need more. And I saw the power of coaching in my own life and in my daughter's life. Um, and I was doing a lot of like, coaching adjacent type roles at the time I was working for a large company um, as an employee coach. So it made a lot of sense for me to think, okay, well, I'm coaching already in the corporate 
sector, why not coach on something that I'm totally interested in, fascinated, fascinated on, have direct experience. And I, I saw like how powerful it was and what a big need there is for ADHD coaching. So that's kind of when I started to make that transition. Yeah, that's a really great point. I was just thinking, I was like, yeah, that's probably why I ended up transitioning into coaching um, from, uh, I tra I became a coach after my second was born where I was, you know, had, didn't knew, knew that I never wanted to go back to deadline journalism, but knew that yes. I couldn't like, uh, I could I couldn't work in a newsroom anymore because I had two kids and I just was like, you know, I can't do it anymore. But I also knew that I was like, could never be a freelancer because I was mm. so, I needed deadlines, right? I needed the accountability right. of deadlines. Yeah. And, and I had had such success with, you know, in my own life with coaching that I really appealed to me when mm. I first started it. And, um, but I find that like, time and time again, even though we know it's so effective in terms of the accountability, right? And that idea of, of, you know, like I, I liken it to like a, being a personal trainer, right? Like sometimes people can just go to the gym and they can just get a gym membership and they can do it themselves and they go and they use the equipment and they're totally fine with it. And I'm like, but like a lot of us can't, <laughs> a lot right. of us need yes. uh, the accountability <laughs> of like, some people can even just like sign up for a class and go to a class and that's great. And sometimes you know that like you need a personal trainer, you need somebody who's going to keep you accountable. But at the same time, I also feel like, accountability is one of the things that so many of us struggle with. Like we should be able to do things on our own, right? Like it's like this, right. this mental hurdle of like, oh, there's something wrong with me that I even need somebody to hold me accountable. Like it feels like childish. Yeah. And, I, and, and I think yeah. it's like, there's still a lot of shame around that, right? Around the idea yeah. of like, I need somebody to do this for me. I'm like, I don't know. I think it's pretty mm -hmm. brilliant. <laughs> Honestly, I think one of the best things we can do as adults with ADHD is get comfortable with getting support. And whether that means support running your home, support as in like a community of people that understand you and are cheering for you or the accountability of working with a coach or something like that. But um, we can do so much more with the right resources than we can when we're constantly like trying to just like live in the shoulds, right? Like I should be able to do this and just, you know, pushing through those things that are really hard for us. Like it takes away the energy that we could be spending on the things that we're really good at. And people with ADHD oftentimes are really good at some things, but when we're so caught up in the things that are hard for us and not accessing support, it's hard to have the time and energy to lean into those strengths. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know that was so mind blowing for me. Um, that, that idea of the default mode network and yes. you know, the, the fact that it's more interesting for our brains to think about everything that's going wrong. Cause there's, dop there's dopamine in that. There's no dopamine in all the yeah. effortless things that are going right in our life. 100%. So, <laughs> and that was such, that was so transformative for me to think about like, huh, I wonder what, like, you know, I'm like, why am I so depressed all the time? Maybe it's because all I do is think about what's not working in my life. And if somebody's, you know, mm -hmm. compliments me, I think you, you were talking about that recently too, right? Like, uh, you know, how we were so dismissive of any time people compliment us, or it's like really uncomfortable to feel, to sit in your accomplishments. Um, yeah. And I always thought that was like, well, women are socialized to like, you know, not brag, but I think there's so much more under the surface when it comes to how our brains operate and like where it's just not interesting. <laughs> Absolutely. Like we like to, we don't like to, but we tend to talk right over our accomplishments. And I also think with the way our memory works with ADHD, sometimes we have to be really intentional to like remind ourselves how far we, you know, like we're only seeing the problems that are in front of us now. And sometimes we have to like have a practice of going back and evaluating where we used to be and everything we have done. And if we're not intentional about it, our brain is just going to hold on to those problems that, like you said, are more interesting at the moment than going back and like, you know, acknowledging our success and our growth. Mm -hmm. Well, I think also you can, you can learn from what is working in your life in terms of like yes. extrapolating, like, what is it about that that seems to work for me as opposed to, 
you know, something that I might struggle with in terms of, you know, how boring it is or how mundane or routine it is. You know, what is it about the things that I feel effortless that I can apply to the things that I have more difficulty in too. And I think we, we don't pay attention. Like, I think we just, we exist in this world where, where, you know, it's like, nothing works for me. I'm a hot mess. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Like, well, it's usually not the case. To be in that like black and white, right? Like it's either all good or all bad. Um, so it is important to, like you said, gather that evidence, like look at what's actually working and apply that to other areas and move forward in that way. But it's not always something that comes to us naturally. So we have to sometimes have, like you said, the accountability of working with someone or having a group or something like that, that, you know, can help us see ourselves outside of ourselves, like look at us through a different lens and remind us. Um, and, you know, over time, we can learn to kind of like self coach through those things. But um, it isn't something that most of us are born to do. Our brain does want to find the negative most of the time. Mm, yeah. What do you think has changed the most in your mindset? Since your diagnosis, I don't know if that's even an answerable question. There's so much. Oh my god, so <laughs> much! Oh my goodness! You know, a huge thing for me was for the longest time I thought the way to achieve um, success or whatever that means was to really have um, increasingly high standards for myself. I was definitely a perfectionist most of my life. And I think a lot of it now makes sense with, um, you know, being undiagnosed for so long. Um, And it was just such a huge light bulb moment when I realized how much that perfectionism was causing me to self-sabotage. Like when I first thought about getting on Instagram to, you know, find clients and promote my coaching business, I just didn't think I could do it because I didn't think I could talk on a camera. I didn't know how to do it, honestly. Like, I didn't know how to make a reel or um, I was also really worried about saying the wrong thing or being the expert. And it just um, delayed me from putting myself out there for a long time. And even at the very beginning, if you go back and look at my early Instagram, like I was not that person that jumped on Instagram and grew right away. Like I, I took me a long time. I think it was like, I worked with a coach to help me and she was amazing, but I could tell she was like, why isn't it working? Like you're not growing. Like what is going on? And I think it's because I was being a perfectionist and I wouldn't post things until they were perfect. So that meant that I wasn't being very consistent. Um, and I wasn't being very authentic either at first. So really learning that, you know, I'm enough where I'm at, that ADHD is part of me, but it's not all of me. And accepting kind of those things, like the the cupboards that are a hot mess always in my car that's like never cleaned out and not putting my focus there all the time anymore. Not trying to like constantly work from a place of bringing up any deficit that I had, um, but also just, you know, kind of like, Managing the symptoms that needed to be managed, but then putting more of my intention into what I was good at was like a huge shift for me. Um, And it just feels so much better not trying to live up the impossible standards I had. Right. I know. I feel like so much of the time before my diagnosis, I was always like, trying to rein it in, right? Where I was like, oh, I'm yeah. accidentally blurting out things and I, sh- I oh, I got to I got to rein that in or like I got to tidy that mm-hmm. up, like pull back. It was always about like how can I kind of gather up all of this chaotic things that had fallen out of my overflowing bag of me. Yes. <laughs> and like yes. how can I get it all back in? And now I'm like, oh my god, there's so much power and healing in just dumping it all out. Yes. Be the real you, right? friends with that person that's like so so perfect that they're putting their perfectionistic expectations on them too you know what i mean like adhd people are fun most of the time we are i think we're great to be in conversations with they may not be very like linear we're gonna go in circles but we're gonna have a good time we know so many interesting things like why not lean into those pieces of ourselves and let go of the things that we used to think were like such a big deal and that we were so bad at um, and 
just trying to fix all the time, you know, like it, it feels so much better to just be authentic and um, see what the world's reaction to that is, because a lot of times it's a much more positive than we think it's going to be. Yeah, totally. I know it is. It is. It does feel like you're standing on the edge of a cliff sometimes when it, with, especially when it comes to putting yourself out there on social media. I still like, I'm constantly, I get wrapped up in that, like, oh, it has to be perfect. It has to be well researched, it, uh, you know, and, um, and, you know, and, and then I suddenly I'm like, oh no, it's been like three months since I posted something. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's so I do think like, um, as a creator, and it's funny that I'm even using the, that word to describe my because I never anticipated this kind of having this impact, especially after six months of, you know, one like every time I posted. But um, there's a lot that I think we have to like sort through when we're putting ourselves out there in that way, because a lot of us, you know, we struggle with RSV sometimes. So those negative scroll comments that other people can just like delete and block and have it not affect them. Like it affects us, you know, and I'm like the queen of typos. So it's almost a guarantee that there's going to be a typo in almost everything I post. So like I try to proofread, my brain does not see it. And, you know, I don't want to delete everything I post after people comment. So there's always going to be people, you know, and I, uh, most of the time people are not rude about that, but, um, there's so much opportunity for us to ruminate and overthink about like what we're posting and what we're putting out there. Um, so, you know, that has been a challenge, but it's also been like, I think a great exercise in continuing to like unlearn that perfectionism and that piece. Um, while it's been really hard, I think it's been really valuable and has translated into other areas of my life as well. Mm, now how that's so yeah i love that how do you um how do you like manage boundaries around people asking you to help them personally for free all the time in your dms because <laughs> i know you must i get it and you have so many more followers than i do so i know you must get it all the time you know i um i do i feel like try to give a lot of support away for free. It's just, um, you know, I've thought about this a lot of like, do I need to have a specific boundary? There are questions I won't answer for people. There, there usually is where, you know, I have to steer them to like either join my membership or I point them in a direction of, you know, a resource. Um, but I am a very service minded and I get a lot of um, joy and satisfaction out of interacting with my audience. So I don't have like a specific boundary around that. I'm sure that's not the people are thinking they're going to hear. Um, I will say that I always ask for grace from this. We do get so many DMs and the way Instagram is filtering things, you know, sometimes I just don't see things, um, you know, and I will like not answer. So I hope people aren't listening to this and being like, well, I sent you a DM two months ago and you didn't get back to me and you're saying you get back to people. But um, so I do always ask for the understanding that you're talking to somebody with ADHD too. But, um, you know, I do try to have boundaries with myself more. Um, like I really focus on understanding my capacity and I usually will not um, even open my DMs if I'm not at a point where I can actually give them some time. Um, if I'm like, you know, with my kids or it's the weekend or things like that, I only will do that if I am telling myself this is like a something I want to do versus something I feel like I have to do. So it's kind of more personal boundaries for me versus like trying to make boundaries with my audience. Yeah. Oh, good. I like that. Um, yeah, it's been, it's been such a learning process for me <laughs> to all in this journey of just like how, you know, what am I okay with and what, you know, where, I'm, where right. in terms of, you know, do I feel like I'm being put upon? Do I, you know, am I feeling like I'm doing all this stuff for free all the time? And yet there's always more, you know, and I'm, you know, and I'm like, mm. I don't, I don't ever want to get to a point where I resent, you know, posting or just resent being on social media, but I also have to be like so strict and I'm like always pulling back in terms of what I, you know, yeah, like how much I'm constantly attending to and giving in, in that platform. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's something that 
capacity in general is something that's super important for us to really understand and manage uh, with ADHD, because like you said, there's always more we can give, right? And we tend to be very giving people. So really checking in with yourself and understanding like, am I getting resentful of having to do this? And that's when you, I think it, you know, it's a good time to reevaluate if you're having those feelings. Mm-hmm. Or also like just that idea that you like, there's so much I want to do. Like I want to do all of the things, mm-hmm. <laughs> but yes. again, right. Yes. And I think it's like, how can we hold on to that enthusiasm, which I think is wonderful. I love that about myself mm-hmm. and, and how I approach things that like, I'm always want, I'm always the one with the hand up to volunteer or to help, but like, you know, how can I hold on to that enthusiasm, but at the same time, like realize that that is actually quite unhealthy for my mental health a lot of the time. Yeah. And like, you know, realizing that um, it, the answer is almost always to do less and pull back. Yeah, it is definitely. I think that with ADHD, too, we don't always recognize that sometimes impulsivity can, uh, impulsivity can show up for us as being the one to raise our hand. Yes, I'll do this. Being the one to like be asked to, you know, do a volunteer opportunity. Like we almost always will react without that pause. So understanding that we have that tendency and having something to like kind of pull out of our back pocket, like I kind of have a rule with myself, especially when it comes to volunteerism, um, to say, I'm really interested in evaluating if this opportunity is right for me, I will get back to you tomorrow. And if I don't, you can ping me or you can email me because again, like I need to put that upon or that responsibility back on the person asking because I'll forget. But um, that even if I'm feeling like, yes, I want to say yes in the moment, I haven't taken the time yet to evaluate, like, what am I going to have to give up to do this? Like, do I actually have the kind of capacity to say yes to this? So kind of training myself to pause has been really, really helpful with not kind of pushing and just grabbing on to more all the time, because there are so many exciting opportunities and we do want to say yes to a lot of things. I know, right? That's one of my, I get caught up in that. It's my pet peeve now when businesses like will email and be like, you know, we really want to talk to you about this. Can we jump on a call tomorrow? And I'm like, I understand why you're doing that. You know, you want to be, you want to be specific and not open-ended and like, you know, but I'm so resistant to that. I'm like, I see what you're doing and no, (laughs) you're not going to like take advantage of my impulsive nature. Yes, and we're good. Like, so we got like dot connection, so we can better the dots of like are so good in this. And so we can understand like, oh, they're doing this because they like they know I'm gonna say yes right away, you know, and create that sense of urgency. So know, using right? that that strength we have to kind of remind ourselves that we can. Yeah, I'm on to you. I, I've been in I've been in twelve different businesses. I figured it out. <laughs> um, and and okay, so I, I what do you what would you say you love most about your ADHD? We've kind of talked around that with uh, you know how f- your reels and I mean you just I I know I said this already, but like you have so much helpful information on your Instagram account. If there's if you're not following. Meredith, her, her, uh, Instagram account will definitely be in the, um, uh, my show notes, hummingbird eight, is it hummingbird ADHD with an underscore? I don't, I uh, don't have it in front of me. Yeah. The the underscore is between hummingbird and ADHD. So hummingbird underscore ADHD. Got it. Uh, All right. You know, um, so to your question around what do I love about my ADHD? Um, I love that I am just like a fun for learning new things. I am such a curious person. I have been my whole life. And um, there's just always something new to learn. And I think it makes me like, pretty fun at a party. Like I always have something to talk about. I can relate to a lot of people because I'm so curious. Um, And a lot of my curiosity presents in wanting to really like truly understand and see people. Like when people are telling me their story, I'm always so curious to know more and understand. And I think it helps me in so many ways, but it helps me be really empathetic as well, because I've heard so many stories and I've asked so many questions um, that it's easy for me to 
on empathy for people, even people that have different views than me and live different lives than me and things like that. And um, I just love that my curious nature and my interest driven brain has kind of led me to explore so many different topics and learn so much about different people and things like that. Yeah, that I I love that. And I also am similar. Like it, it was so freeing for me to think about how much I love learning when it came to, you know, just like I love reading about topics and I, and I, I, I love when there's no pressure to retain the information, <laughs> right? Because I was like, and, and once I had that, once I realized that like I was somebody who loved like input, but was really, mm -hmm. really bad at output, right? In, ter in terms right. of like, I really struggled in school with like, I would be have perfect attendance in school, I would have, especially in university, I would have perfect attendance, I'd go to office hours, I would do all the things I take all the notes. And then when it came to taking the test, I just was like, I would kind of like, do okay. You know, like, I just never felt like my output ma matched the enthusiasm of my input. And so I always like had that negative association with school and like, but I always loved, you know, throughout life when the pressure's off to just like learn about things, I'm like, I love it. Like, that's my favorite hobby. <laughs> um, I mean, that's the beauty of being an adult, right? It's like, we have more capacity for that than when we're kids and they're like constantly, you know, forcing us to learn things we might be not be interested in. But <laughs> Um, I do think it's really incredible. And I will say that I, when I talk to a lot of people with ADHD and they're also fascinating in their own way. And I think a lot of it is because we are so curious and so driven. And I think also I, there, I, I find a lot of us are able to really kind of connect dots between, yeah. you know, when it comes to certain information that you can be like, oh yeah, that also reminds me of this. And, and, and I think it makes for fascinating meandering realizations, right? Mm -hmm. So that you can have like a yeah. deeper insight into idea, you know, ideas and conversation for sure. I laugh yeah, so, I think it's so go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> you know, when you talk about that, like dot connecting, like that intuition that we develop because of that, I think it's so much more powerful than anyone talks about. And it's hard to always like kind of pinpoint when it's happening, but we are kind of those people like in, in the corporate world where people are probably like wanting us to brainstorm with them. Like we're the people that, um, you know, people want us to put that different lens on things. And I, I think it's really cool to think about. And there's actual like explanations for why our brain is like this, you know. I, you cracked me up the other day when you posted about watching trailers and reading book reviews. Cause I, it made me laugh so hard. Cause I was like, it's true. Like I will, I will, I love watching trailers and I really don't like watching the movie. Cause I'm like, we already did this in the trailer. <laughs> part, right? uh, but I just love them. I feel like it's such an art form to come up with, uh, you know, a three minute synopsis of a movie. And I always appreciate the editing and everything, but I'm like, there's also just that part of me. That's like, I wish all movies were only three minutes. long. Yeah. Honestly, I, for me, it's just committing to like paying attention to something for an hour and a half. Like I want to know that this movie is going to grab me. Like you need to like prove to me that this is going to be worth it. Because it's so hard for us to like have that sustained attention on something if it's not really interesting to us, you know? And I think that's where I'm like, okay, trailer, trailer, trailer. And then I'm distracted and I'm like walking over here to do something. And I forgot I was even looking for a movie. So I feel like there's a lot going on with that behavior. Um, but most of it can be tied to ADHD. I know, right? And same with reading reviews, right? Where it's like, okay, I want mm. as much, I want to know as much as possible about what it is that I might like potentially be getting or buying or reading. Yeah. And, and, but I also just find them so entertaining and it's like a hobby. <laughs> yeah. I reading the reviews. That's the rabbit hole for sure. <laughs> Um, uh, yeah, whenever I get a negative review for this podcast, I've always like, uh, I have so much RSD around it. And so I'm like, it's very meta for me when I think, when I talk about like, you know, the, the very few times somebody's given me a one star review for my podcast. Uh, but I'm also usually trying to be like, to, to have empathy for that person who's reviewing it where I'm like, you know, they're probably like really want to get as much information as possible about ADHD as quickly as possible. And they're listening to this podcast. They're angry because they're like, what are you guys rambling on about? Um, <laughs> and I'm like, I yeah. have so many times impulsively just like anger, had anger outbursts as a result of my ADHD that I'm like, it's okay. You can have your anger outburst. It's fine. I don't mind. 
Yeah. I get it. I've yeah. been there. You know, I love approaching that. Um, when we're doing anything that is for like public consumption, right? With the RSC fees, I honestly see it impacting my business too. Like when you talk about reviews, I have a really hard time asking my clients for feedback. Like they're asking happy, they're telling me they're happy, but it's like so hard for me to send that like end of session survey or something like that. And I'll get the notification. I won't want to open it because what if they said something bad? And I think that's a real issue for a lot of us with ADHD. And sometimes it holds us back from even starting the thing we're dreaming about doing. You know what I mean? I wonder how many podcasters are out there that haven't started their podcast yet because they know those reviews are going to be so hard for them. So I just want to say, I think it takes a ton of courage, you know, with, as a person with ADHD to put a podcast together and know you're going to get feedback that may not always be kind or positive. Oh, yeah. Well, and if if my first reviews had been that terrible, you know, I I would have yes. quit 100%. Uh, I, yeah. You know, I, those re- the positive reviews are absolutely what keep me going and, and give me the dopamine. And I feel like if I had had negative reviews right at the beginning, I would have quit immediately. And so now now that when I do get them, I'm sort of like it's a point of pride where I'm like, oh, I'm popular enough to get negative reviews. <laughs> I definitely notice I get the full comments when my content is doing really well on Instagram. So I, I do the same thing. I'm like, oh, help us be like reaching more people now. Um, I will say we talk about the negativity a lot. But there's the people in the ADHD community, I think, are overwhelmingly supportive. And since so many of us spent so much of our lives not understanding how our brain works, I have seen so much like kindness and support of other people in that position from, um, you know, the interactions that happen on my page, from the interactions that happen in the groups that I run, that that same, you know, like you described, going back and reminding yourself of the positive, like there's so much positive to draw on when that negative comes in that, you know, when we can use that tool, it can really help us not get too caught up in that. Yeah, good point. I love that. I will try to take that to heart. I'll just, I'll just remember I have to listen to this episode whenever I'm having trouble yeah. with that. Uh, so now I'd love to ask if you could rename ADHD to something uh, a little less confusing. Would you call it something else? Oh my gosh. I knew this question was coming because I listened to your podcast and naming things has always been my like Achilles heel. Like anytime I started a business, I can never name it. Name me. Oh my gosh. It's so hard for me. And I actually could ask this question to my audience. I had a post on this um, several months ago and got so many responses that were so creative and fun. Um, and I think what's hard about this question is that like ADHD is so much, right? And trying to find a phrase or some like a term that really can um, encompass everything about ADHD. It's so multifaceted. It feels impossible to me. But I will say I would love to see us getting away from the word disorder. And I know for a lot of people, like, I don't want to, you know, diminish how much struggle can come with ADHD. But I think when that that main word we're hearing, I'm not saying it's not a disorder, but when that's like actually in the name, like that, that's kind of where our brain goes, right? Um I think attention deficit is super misleading because we have tons of attention. We just don't know where to put it. We don't, we have trouble regulating it. So I think something around regulating attention um, would be interesting. And, um, you know, again, I just don't have the right words. What are some of your favorites that people have come up with? Well, it's, you know, it's funny because the name Hummingbird is so perfect. I thought for sure you were just going to be like, I already came up with the best name, Hummingbird, <laughs> because it's such a yep. wonderful name. Hummingbird Brain. That's it. That's what we're calling it now. So <laughs> that has quite the long story on how I came up with that name um, as well. And, it, and it's like, I love the story of how, how I named my business this time around. But um, it is hard, right? Like, I think we can all agree that ADHD is so much more than hyperactivity and um, inattention. Like, there's so many other pieces to it. It's it's hard for me to sum that up in the perfect world. Sometimes I wish it was just, like, named after somebody's, like, last name. And then, you know, we weren't trying to, like, tie so much into a name, right? Right, yeah. We could just learn about it without that. No, I know. I, I agree. 
Uh, but I love, I mean, I love the name Hummingbird. It's such a lovely image. And I like how you can always, you know, there's so much of your language around like taking flight. Like there's so much you can do with it. Um, yeah, I so. love a metaphor. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so now you have so many incredible offerings. Um, uh, tell me about your self-led course, because I think that's such a great thing to have available um, for somebody. Is it for people who are just starting out or who who is that course for? It's called ADHD 101, right? Yeah, it's called ADHD 101. I go into um, kind of like the biology of ADHD in one of the modules. And then we talk about the symptoms. We talk about the strengths. And then the final module is just an introduction to some of the tools that you can use uh, to manage your ADHD. And um, one of the reasons I put this course together is because I had been on that path of really trying to get a lot of information about ADHD. And I kept like trying to find that perfect book. And I was trying to find, you know, all of these pieces. And there's so many great books out out there, but so many of them are really long, you know, and I wanted something a little bit more interactive that I could offer to people that had been in that position that I was that were like, I need more info than the pamphlet that was given to me at the doctor's office. I need to dive in and I'm reading these articles and I'm consuming this information on the internet, but I need it kind of like tied together in one package that I can reference. Um, so I really just wanted to create something that was like accessible uh, to a broad population. So I, I think it's a great option uh, for people that are recently diagnosed. I also think, um, you know, a story I hear a lot with people I work with is like, yeah, I was diagnosed 10 years ago, but nobody really taught me about ADHD. Like I just knew I couldn't sit still in school. So for those um, people too that are like, I, I'm just now learning there's so much more to ADHD. I think that's a great resource. And I've even had parents of children with ADHD that want to understand what's happening for their children better. It's not parenting focused, but I think that one of the best ways we can help our loved ones is by understanding them better. So I think that there is a broad appeal there. Yeah. And I think that kind of, like we said earlier in the episode, like that helping your child will, will, uh, you know, usually you spring into action in that, like, Oh, I have to get, I have to do all the things. And and then you'll probably yeah. learn you have ADHD in the process. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's my fault. But that's you find a provider. <laughs> Absolutely. But, um, okay, and then you also have um, you've got your hummingbird hive, right? And and the monthly membership too, right? Yeah. So the hummingbird hive is a monthly membership. Um, the the hummingbird hive is kind of a space where we have like a we have an outside platform out of Facebook and Instagram where we can have like kind of message board type conversations for support. And then we have weekly meetings for anything from like accountability and planning your week. Like we meet every Monday to like just have dedicated time to look at our week and say, okay, this is what I want to focus on the most. Um, we also have um, at least one meeting a week where I do office hours and people can drop in anytime within the hour and ask me questions. Or a lot of times what usually happens is we all just start chatting and we just get to hang out with other people with neurodivergent brains. I think that, you know, that's such a gift to, to be able to share space with other people whose brains work like ours do um, and just kind of create community around that. So that's a great option for people that uh, really just are looking to connect with others with ADHD and be part of a community. Yeah, I know. I feel like a broken record when I'm like, find your people, because it's so true how, you know, the power of community, especially for neurodivergent women, it's that val the validation that is that comes from having a conversation about things like shame and, you know, and, and how we are all kind of fascinating in incredible, you know, women who also feel like hot messes. <laughs> like I, I always say, like, I'm always like a conversation with another ADHD woman is like undoing the button on a too tight pair of pants. Like it just feels so good. And I learned so much more about me through a, a, a one hour conversation than I ever would through a book or an article or, you know, a medical text or anything like that. And so it's like, it's so, I just feel like it's so beneficial to like, you know, 
to have just those random conversations about like what we do and, and also crowdsourcing, I think is something that we don't realize that we've always sort of been intuitively that person who's gathering knowledge. Right. And it's like, Oh, yeah. like many of us, when we were diagnosed with ADHD immediately went to Facebook and like joined all the Facebook groups. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> I'm like, there's a reason yeah. why we do that because we are gathering of, inf you know, gathering as much information as possible. But also I think it's like very, healing to realize, oh my goodness, this is not just me, right? Other people are experiencing this. 100%. Yeah, I think that that's something that's so common for people with ADHD as they go a lot of their life feeling like they're different and they can't really put their finger on why. And then they get that diagnosis or they, you know, are self-diagnosed and feel like, wow, I finally have an answer here. And they may not know anybody else with ADHD or they probably do, but they don't know they know somebody else with ADHD because, you know, they haven't disclosed or people aren't talking about it. And then being able to be in this community where you can all like have a contest to see how, who has the most unread emails and like everyone's <laughs> laughing and nobody's horrifying. Like that's what happened in our group yesterday is. Somebody was talking about managing communications, and I'm like, I've got 10,000 unread emails in my office, and she's like, 10,000, and we all just felt seen and comfortable, like, sharing that fact about ourselves, and, you know, we weren't worrying about that person, like, side-eyeing us, that we're not organized, and, you know, we all have our own systems, like, they, there's reasons we have all those unread emails, like, I like to search through and find that information I might have missed, but... Um, you know, my point is that like just sharing space with other people that are expecting and like you said, we can crowdsource, we can learn about each other. Um, and it's just a breath, breath of fresh air when you've spent your whole life feeling like, okay, I'm different, but I don't really understand why or how. That's so interesting. You know, I was, I, what you, it's true. Like so many of us have found, felt like I'm different. And I can't put my finger on it. I don't know why. And yet when we find out what's different about us, we realize that like, those are things we thought everybody else did. <laughs> and we didn't realize <laughs> that not everybody is like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's and that realization definitely keeps me early after your pod today, Katie. Um, <laughs> I don't know what's happening with my ears. Uh, um, you know, I learned that after a living, like, I feel like I was surrounded by like, people that were super organized and that, you know, my husband is super organized. My best friend is really organized. And I don't know if I was drawn to them because I like craved that like consistency because I was so inconsistent. Um, and again, I'm like totally losing my train of thought here about what I was even talking about. Oh, so I did, I definitely was like very clear on my brain, not operating in what I considered a normal way, but um, there have been those moments throughout the journey of like, oh, okay, yeah, I thought, you know, until I lived with somebody that didn't do things the way I did, it was like, oh, it's not normal to like, constantly be like, putting your coffee pot in the freezer, or like, <laughs> driving away with, you know, a cup of coffee on your car, or panicking at work and ruminating all day that you might have left your curling iron on. Like, I, I did kind of think that's how everybody's brain works until I like started talking about it. And then people are like, no, I never do that. I know exactly right yeah. yeah yeah that's funny oh well Meredith thank you so much it's been really wonderful getting to know you a little bit more and and hearing more about your own personal story and I just I can't say enough how much I love your Instagram account and your content and just I think you're doing such amazing things for this community so thank you for sitting down with me thank you for having me Katie it was such an honor to get to connect you know virtually face um, I love your content as well. So this was really, really fun for me. Awesome.